it is the definition of madness that everybody just collectively continues to believe in this tooth fairy that we know is mom. Like it's like we know that this thing doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And every year we're just like, time to make the donuts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined by my distinguished co-host, Rodney Evans. (laughs) The adjectives get better every time. Hi, Aaron and everyone (laughs) out there. On today's episode, it's time for your year-end review. That's right. Step into our office. But before we dig into performance management and everything that's wrong with it, let's check in to see where we're at now that it's December. Did I tell you? I did tell you that I have a new reason for why we do check-in questions. Tell of everybody else because the they're going to love it. That I give in my shtick on this podcast and everywhere else that you can find me. There's a new one, which is now that we are all doing remote meetings most of the time, soon to be all of the time again, it's a really easy way to start a meeting on time. So when we all get onto the Zoom and someone is running three or four minutes late, which we don't shame them for because we're human beings who have to use bathrooms sometimes, (laughs) just starting the check-in round lets us start bang on the hour and people can roll into it as they come. And we all feel like we haven't wasted those three minutes. We've done something to that is productive. And the people who are joining us have missed something, but they haven't missed something they can't catch up on. And when you get really varsity around it, you cannot tell the late joiners what the question is and make them guess. And then that that favorite, favorite part adds levity and humor for the rest of us when they answer incorrectly. So (laughs) that is our new reason for doing a check in round question. And the question for today is, (laughs) <laughs> you laugh that you put this in here. Why are you so hard on yourself? We're going to start with you because I feel like you've got one in the chamber. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like as I get towards the end of the year, I always get into an evaluative mode and this whole episode is going to be about evaluation. And so I just thought like, you know what? Why are we so hard on ourselves? And for me, I think it's because ultimately I hold myself to a really high standard. I've always sort of uh, admired people who are disciplined and who are excellent at what they do and who kind of set themselves apart. But when I unpack why I want that, I think it's about meaning or being important or mattering in some way. And so Mm -hmm. I always get kind of in this weird, possibly unhealthy loop about like, if I'm not doing great, if I'm not doing the most, then do I matter? And I think Mm -hmm. that's something I always have to like pull apart at the end of the year and be like, actually, you can just be a human being and it doesn't matter and you can let it go. So this year has been a big year of relaxing a little bit on that stuff. And when I feel those feelings creeping up, just kind of being like, hey, breathe. It's a Mm -hmm. weird year. Like, Mm -hmm. just do what you can. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like (laughs) the drug beat of just like, I'm doing my best. Yes. One that we can all live with. This is an interesting question. I don't think I am particularly hard on myself. Okay, I thought you might say that. Yeah, my particular neurosis is a different one. So I tend to be someone who has struggles with future tension, with anxiety, with over-preparation, and with perfectionism. And because of that, when something does not go as well as it might or when I fail in some way, it is very easy for me to be like, I did the best I could because I did too much. Uh, I already did too much. So right. if it didn't, if I am disappointed in some way, I find resilience from my over preparation. <laughs> so I just don't, when something doesn't go how I want it to, or I feel disappointed about something, I have a pretty easy time bouncing back quickly and being like, mm. I did the best I could. Right. So I'm not that hard on myself mechanism. in that way. Yeah. yeah. It's, I'm very hard on myself in the other way, which is like, if you don't prepare for this, you're a terrible person who doesn't right. deserve Trash. success or love. <laughs> right. Like you're garbage <laughs> if you just show up. But the the upside of that is I don't have a lot of regret afterward. Mm. I guess it's a different way of being hard on yourself. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. It's it's preemptive hardness. It's, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's preemptive let's get ahead of disappointment. This. <laughs> yeah. Let's get ahead to the, to the end here and let's just be hard on ourselves right now. Let's imagine all the ways in which this could go wrong. 
Yeah, oh that's exactly God. right. All right. Well, I think that's the perfect segue into today's topic, which is performance management and related year end madness. Now, everyone out there is starting to go into this process, this universe, this way of thinking and being and doing. And so I thought I would start by asking you as someone that has been out in the real world, which I mostly have not, what is everyone doing out there in the world of work as usual now that it's December and it's time for that year end review stuff? Everyone is writing their self-evaluations and the managers are sitting in calibration sessions. (laughs) So what does that look like? It looks like bullshit. So, I mean, PSA for the rest of this episode, if you love traditional performance management, you're about to hate everything that happens here. (laughs) I come from this world. I have deep roots in talent management as a professional, and I have learned the error of my ways. So what's happening right now that happens every year is that thousands and thousands and thousands of hours are spent on a process that statistically no one believes to add any value, and that generally does more harm than good. And we'll talk about why that is, but things like calibration where you and I as managers of people get into a room to argue about whose people are better based on ideas that are malleable and conjecture that is dysfunctional so that you can pay your people more than I can pay my people, or we can give one promotion slot to Bob's person because he hunger games <laughs> it away from the rest of us is not great for, it's not great for team building. It's not great for the people who are being advocated for. It's not great for anyone except somebody who's got a spreadsheet that says we can only afford three VPs this year and gets their way. It doesn't sound like the most efficient process, that's for sure. (laughs) It is funny that in a world so obsessed with efficiency that we waste so many hours on things like budgeting and performance management and that we ultimately, because they're so asinine, hack them. I was having a conversation with a former client and friend of The Ready recently who was telling me that when they worked somewhere long enough in this particular corporation, they learned that like every three years or so, there was enough difference in who was looking at what and why that you could copy and paste eval stuff from the previous period into the current period. So they just worked there and they just had everything on a rotation on a three year rotation. And it just became this kind of, you know, check the box activity, which sounds not super smart or more helpful. It's terrible. It's a terrible waste of time. It doesn't get us any of the things that we want. And I know that clients of mine right now are going to listen to this and think I'm talking about them. Mm. I'm talking about all of you. Like, <laughs> it's not one of you that I'm There's calling no out exception. right now. Everyone does this. It's, it is the definition of madness that everybody just collectively continues to believe in this tooth fairy that we know is mom. Like, it's like, we know that this thing doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And every year we're just like, time to make the donuts. I couldn't agree more. The problem at the heart of this is that I don't know that we're all clear on what we're trying to do. So if you look at just like PD in general, but definitely like end of year performance management, it has too many goals, right? So like one part of the goal is, okay, well, we want to obviously give people feedback so they can improve, right? And that makes sense. Except that we don't work on a one-year time horizon for feedback and feedback probably shouldn't just be given when it isn't asked for and probably shouldn't just be generalized. It should be focused on things people want to actually work on and build, et cetera. So it's like this impersonal, very slow feedback loop that is not particularly helpful. And there's lots of fun data to show how it's useless also that one-sided. is. It's also one-sided. It's not exactly Totally one-sided. Loop. It's just yeah. me being like, here are the ways in which I think you suck or are fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's yes. right. And fix it or you're out. Right. So that's one thing it tries to do. Another thing that it tries to do is mess with people's comp. So, yeah. oh, in addition to telling you how you sucked this year, we also want to make sure that we reward you appropriately for the ways in which you didn't suck. Mm-hmm. And so we're also going to be dividing uh, certain pots of money or rewards or equity or what have you around. And so it's going to do that at the same time. It also, to your point, is often a little bit about like rank and yank. So like yeah. maybe we have a certain number of people that have to go or we want to know Tells who's us who the best. Fire. 
Yeah. yeah, we want or who to promote or who are, you know, my my favorite thing to hate on is the high potentials thing. Who are our high <laughs> potentials, right? How can um, we know? So- <laughs> How can we possibly know if we don't use a nine box grid? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, potentials for what? So it's also doing that work. And then when you put all that in the hopper and shake it up, it stinks. Okay. It can't do all those things well at the same time, which is the same problem that we talked about when we talked about budgeting, where you can't be doing yes. a forecast and a target at the same time. Yes. And I would add to that, that not only is performance management unclear on the outcome, it is unclear on the input or what it is Mm -hmm. designed for. And when you get the more progressed and woke people, ops people in the mix, they want to hack it with communication and with words and with training and with massaging rather Mm -hmm. than changing any of the mechanics. Right. So like you talk to the more progressed people, ops people in a traditional organization and they're like, performance management doesn't have to be so bad. We can't change the system. We can't change the force distribution. We can't change the formulaic (laughs) approach to compensation, but we can change how this happens. And it's like, no, no, You can't actually change the inputs or the outcomes without changing the middle. You have to change something about the practice to make that change. So one of my least favorite tropes in the whole end of year circus is the more progressed people ops people who are like just through sheer will and communications and messaging and massaging, we can overcome the structure and workflow that we have. And that is a lie. And everybody knows it's a lie and we should stop saying it. Totally. Yeah. Again, I think when you try to design a widget to do too many things, it doesn't matter how you use it or how you play with it or how you optimize it. Like it just can't be good at all those things. Right. So you cannot simultaneously have a tool that is the best at providing human development and feedback and growth and mastery, and also have a tool that is the best at allocating the profit from this year. At the exact same time. It doesn't matter who's doing it or how woke they are, how we fix the process. Like that is a math problem that does not equal out. That's right. And I would say the version of end of year process that we typically see, which is self-evaluation, manager 360 evaluation, performance management conversation, management calibration layer, data fed into something that spits back bonus and salary information, whatever version of that is happening out there, it is not good at any of the things Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it's been co-opted to try to do all the things. Right, right, So the processes that exists today in most places actually serves no valuable function. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a totally fair assessment, right? Yeah. A, A camel is a horse drawn by committee. It's the same thing here. And I I think the solution, we can talk more about how to sort of be insurgent to the system as it exists Mm. in a minute. But I think the solution for the progressive organization, for the one that has the chance to, to tear it up and start over, is just to ask the questions one at a time, what is the best way that is most people positive and most complexity conscious to do each of these activities? So what is the best way to promote healthy development and mastery and the growth of our capabilities and skills and maturity as participants in this system? Well, my guess is if you ask that question, you're going to get answers like, we should probably be really authentic with each other and have some like radical candor and real talk. We should probably have people driving their own feedback process on some, you know, either regular basis or even intuitively, where they're asking for what they want to get better at. We should probably be playing a game that is much more frequent and not annual because human beings learn hour to hour, day to day, week to week, definitely not month to month or year to year. Like, I don't remember what happened in January or February or March. Not really. I mean, my God, this year has been such a blur, right? I can't play that game. So I can play the game of like what happened in the last two days and what do I remember as like standout moments from the year? And you want me to rate you based on that memory? Like that is such a garbage Time horizon. So those are a couple things. And I bet you have others that that also would drive a better feedback approach. Yeah, I would add to that in terms of feedback. You know, of course, it should be user centered and user controlled. So what I mean by that is the individual should determine what kind of feedback they're looking 
for and who from, because we don't really hear feedback that is done to us by people who just want to. And also, and this is a piece that is so often missing, is what does good look like? Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I know a bunch of ears out there perk up and go like, let me show you my competency model. And I'm going to ask you respectfully to put that shit away because I don't want to see it. I've seen it before. (laughs) What we, when I'm talking about what good looks like, the error that happens, understandably. And when I say this stuff, please know that I have made these models and sold them (laughs) to people. So I am guilty of this, but now I know better. And so I want to tell other people that too. Something like a competency model or something like a set of attributes is a complicated solution to complexity. So a human being is complex. We have attributes, personalities, identities, egos, moods, contexts that we are living in, et cetera, et cetera. A competency model that says to be a VP here, you need to do these 10 things is not useful. And it's not useful for a variety of reasons. But the two that I want to point to is one, Competency models and their ilk, and these are also the things that come up, that pop up in your HRIS as descriptors for the next level of promotion, describe the container, not the thing. So Mm. they say at a VP level, a competency is sales. What does that mean? Am I supposed to have my own book of business? Am I supposed to be great at pitching? Am I supposed to have a close rate of a certain percentage? Am I supposed to spend 20% of my time on new business leads? Move away from a descriptor like at a VP level, one needs financial acumen to something like steers a P&L of X amount of dollars or whatever the demonstrated things are that we need people to know. That's a really significant shift. But when I show people in the world what like a demonstrated skills matrix looks like or how we think about demonstrated skills in terms of our hiring process and evaluating whether someone has demonstrated a skill, they start to really grok it and be like, Mm -hmm. oh, rather than it being this checkbox of like, just descriptors. It's like something I can observe and be able to say, yes, Aaron can do this. And I watched him or no, he can't. Like that from a developmental perspective is a really big shift. Like move away from the complicated solution that is descriptor oriented to the more simple and complexity conscious solution that is demonstrated skills oriented. That's right, because in complexity, methods and paths and strategies are not obvious. And so all we can describe are outcomes, right? Like you tell me I want the cars to move faster down the highway, and then I have to figure out all the different levers and knobs I can pull and twist to get that to happen. But there are 15 different ways to try to do that. Ten of them might work. Five of them don't. Like, depends on if it's a Sunday or a Monday, the weather. There's just so many variables. And it's the same thing that we run into when we try to describe, like, what a great salesperson does. Right. Like, oh, yeah, you know, the best salespeople on the floor all have these attributes. Well, no, they don't. Because as soon as you describe that, along comes Henry, whose dad happens to be at the UN and has this crazy Rolodex and can just make a call and do a million dollar deal and doesn't check any of the other boxes. No hygiene, no organization, no discipline, rent to the wrong college. You know what I mean? But it's just like the fact of the matter is the right things line up to drive that outcome. And then by by vice versa, there might be someone that has a completely different approach. So I definitely I like that demonstrated skills or outcomes driven assessment uh, of what we're looking for. And then the how we get it or even how people build those skills and those competencies is like such a winding road. So we don't have to we don't have to labor too long in trying to design for that. I think rather we want to create marketplaces and ecosystems where people will get the reps, they'll get the chances, they'll get the feedback if they want it, and they will maneuver in the direction of better. Mm -hmm. And basically all I need to know, I mean, it's funny, like we probably do too little in this area at the ready. But one thing we've done well is just design a system where like people get a lot of reps and a lot of contact and ideally a lot of person to person feedback. And the only question you have to ask is, is everybody on the team on average better at this than they were a year ago? And the answer is like, yeah, pretty much. I'd say on average, we're better. 
So right. let's keep on keeping on, right? We don't have to over-engineer, like you said, Hunger Games. <laughs> we don't have to over-engineer that in order to meet our goals as a business, right? It's it's yeah, all that's right. it's yeah, it's all connected. And when you, you know, in the example about Henry with, with the Rolodex, because I've been as an HR professional, I've been in conversations like that where we talk about an outlier and the instinctual move is to add a level of complication to the model. Right. So it's like, oh, let's right. add a competency that's about, you know, network. Right. And it's like, right, no, right, right. no, 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 no. The opposite of that. What we don't do when there's an outlier is use that as a data point that our framework is incomplete. We mm-hmm. need to use it as a signal that the framework is not necessary. Is bunk. Yeah. Is bunk. The framework is bunk. Yeah, I think that's right. And the other thing about the <laughs> developmental aspect of all of this is there's a real varsity play here when you get out of traditional talent management, which is how does one assess what their own gaps are? So what I think is very clear to me and very clear in our own company is the way that you develop is through practice and putting yourself in a situation where you can get practice. Mm -hmm. What I think can be less clear is identifying what the things are that you need to practice. And if you're someone who's quite self-aware and just kind of pays attention to what's going on around you, then maybe that's not so difficult. But I do think that that is something that is tricky. And in the absence of having a manager in a traditional organization who says, you know, Rodney, what you really need to work on is your presentation skills – how does one assess what the things are that they should practice more? Well, it is funny because as you're saying this, I'm thinking to myself the you know, the solution to this is really simple to say, hard to implement, but pays dividends when you invest in it, which is people at the company need to do a better job of asking two questions on their own behalf on a regular basis. One of those questions is, what are my blind spots? And the other mm-hmm. question is, what am I awesome at? What am I amazing at? What do I like really blow your hair back at? And if all we did was take every dollar an hour we spend in end of year nonsense was just driving into people's heads that in this culture, people like us do things like this. And the thing mm-hmm. we do is we ask each other what our blind spots are from time to time and we take it seriously. And we ask each other what makes us great, what our superpowers are from time to time. And we take that seriously. That would be 10,000 times more effective. 10,000 times more effective. (laughs) And to that point, a very simple way of creating more development growth orientation is by noticing the people who have an outstanding strength Mm -hmm. and encouraging others to learn from them. So what happens in a traditional organization is, oh, Aaron is really great at public speaking. Let's analyze what that means in terms of our models. Let's use Aaron as the model that we (laughs) analyze for the framework. What a more interesting and modern approach would be is, hey, if you are not amazing at presenting or you've gotten any indication that you're not amazing, or you just want to be better, you should go talk to Aaron and watch him do it and then do it for him and ask for feedback. And uh, that would be a really great way to up level. There's a thing that happens that's very reductive, which is we should all be equally good at all of the things. Mm-hmm. And the reality in the same is for way. knowledge in the same way. And the reality is for knowledge workers, we have 15,000 different things that we do every day. And if you want to be amazing as a team or a company, you should all be really great at different things in an outsized way. Lean on that in terms of dynamic teaming and learn from one another because the other way of doing it is a race to the middle. That's so, so true. And I I think the two things I would add icing on that cake are, one, the true master of anything will never tell you to do it like they do it. Totally. So if you actually go to someone who's a really good carpenter or a really good, you know, speaker or singer or musician or what have you, they'll they'll share some heuristics with you. They'll share their story. They'll share their point of view. But they'll always start to tailor to like, oh, 
your hands are smaller than mine. So you're going to play this piano piece a little differently than I do. Oh, your interests are different than mine. So you're going to want to be handling this a little. They, they start to see the nuance of the complexity right away. A model does not. A model is like, stand here, do this, be this loud, what have you. And what I continue to drive home with people that I counsel and, and try to mentor a little bit is don't imagine yourself as me because right. I'm not that great and I'm not you. Like, right. imagine yourself as the best version of you. What does that look like? What does that right. feel like? Like, imagine in your mind's eye that you in 20 years are a master of your craft. What does she do? What does she say? What does she sound like? How does she dress? How does she feel? It's not like me, right. right? It's something else. And that's what you need to tune into. And and sort of inversely to that, the other side of it is, when I said, ask people what your blind spots are, I didn't say, tell me what I need to fix or what my weaknesses are, because that's not what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for the insight, and then I can do what I need to do with it. So right. you might expose a blind spot to me that I hadn't seen before. Now I understand something that is lacking for you in your perspective, based on your interaction with me, now I can just wait. Like, does that become a pattern? Does that hold me back in some way? Does that become important to me? Does that open my eyes to something that now I can just steer around? Like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways to go from there that are simpler than just like, these are the three things you need to fix in 2021. Yeah. You know, yeah. which is not not all that. No, I I could not agree more. So let's shift gears now from the performance review part of it to the other part of it that happens end of year, which is about money, which interestingly mm -hmm. enough, the ready is talking about right now, which is, you know, how do we reward performance? How do we incentivize performance? How do we reward performance? And how does that connect to this annual rhythm? So what are your thoughts about that part of the process and how it is broken or not and what might need mm. to be done? Mm. Money is so tricky. <laughs> for so many reasons. And we can talk about practically some of the things that we have tried and some of the things we will try. To me, foundationally, first and foremost, is just decoupling any kind of talent management practice and process from the rewards process. And there is just no way to have those things linked together and not have people make meaning out of that. If you're going to say this number tr in terms of your review translates to this amount or, you know, <laughs> I love the people who are like, no, 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 we don't do that. But what we do is use letters and then it translates to a percentile. I'm like, that's the same thing. Like any version of that, you've just gamified the process. And what you've said to me is in order to get the pellet, I have to do this hoop in this way. I have to play this game with these rules. And so if the point of performance management is to maximize my earnings, fine, but it's not. So just start with the understanding and assumption that you cannot have these things linked together and not have them be bastardized. And then I would start on the financial side, much the way we started this conversation around talent management, with, which is, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to design for? And I just brought a proposal a couple of weeks ago to governance, as you know, that you helped me with that was about rates. And we, Allie and Alistair and I worked on it. And what we really started with was, what are we designing for? And we had a lot of discussion and debate about whether it was about short-term versus long-term orientation, whether it was about maximizing gains for the ready, whether it was about maximizing earnings, whether it was about not constricting a free marketplace, whether it was about equity, et cetera, et cetera. And once we really nailed down what the sort of in order top five things were that we were designing for, then it was pretty easy to come up with different scenarios for how we were going to pay ourselves. But if you <laughs> don't know from a starting point what you're trying to make, it's really hard to figure out what the practice is that will serve it. I think the idea of what do you want is really important to zoom in on. And then to ask the question, what can we design for? Well, that goes back to the complicated complex, right? Some things you can design for, some things you can't design for. If you think you can just nail it right out of the gate and it'll work exactly like you expect, 
probably won't. So the idea is just to say, like, here's what we want to have happen. We know that now. So now when we try this thing that we've designed that we think is right, do we get that thing or not? Right. And then you look back and you steer and you steer and you steer. And after five or 10 years of a culture's development, you'll be pretty happy, I think, with the way you've designed these systems. And what will probably happen is that you tune into simpler and more elegant and more market driven solutions, right? So we've had episodes of the show we talked about feedback. We've had episodes of the show we talked about profit sharing with Nathan. Mm -hmm. Like it is it is really as simple as saying, is it a team sport or not? And how then will we reward the outcomes that we want to reward? And I think it's pretty weird that we believe that we can properly estimate what someone is worth for a whole year in a salary. But we somehow need to wait until December 31st to decide what their extra value is. Right. That somehow like there's this other thing that we're holding back and mm-hmm. waiting to see. I don't know. It's On the one hand, I understand the, that that feels very much like contingent and experimental and waiting to see the reality. On the other hand, I just I don't know that our ability to calibrate and evaluate what happened and what role everyone played is actually all that good for the same reasons that we talked about on the feedback front, right? We just don't even remember what happened. And often when do things do go well, the chemistry of why they went well is rich, is complex. And so the idea that like we got this big deal because Henry's a great salesperson, well, that might be true on face value, but it's not actually true when you peel the onion and start to get into like, well, what did we sell? How was that made? What made it click for the buyer? Like all that stuff that feeds into it, it starts to become very team sporty again. And that leads me right back to like, well, then can't we just have some fixed team sporty way of doing this, whether it's profit sharing or phantom profit sharing that basically just says, when we make more than X, we distribute the proceeds according to this fixed model and we don't have to do all this eval nonsense. I don't know. That's like where my head always goes. Yeah. And there's one experiment that I've run a couple of times that worked pretty well along the bonus line. I have similar issues to you with bonuses. I have another one that I'll talk about, but which is there was a pot of money for bonuses and my team and I did blind in Excel allocation to each of us. And then we looked at where the similarities and divergences were very similar to the exercise I ran for hiring circle compensation. They were astonishingly similar in terms of how (laughs) the money got allocated between like eight or nine different people. And uh, we averaged it out and went with that. And it felt like very transparent. I think it felt fair. I think people were more collectively oriented because it was happening in public collectively than they Mm -hmm. would have if every person was coming to me as the boss and saying like, I think I should get X and she shouldn't. So I'm not saying that that's the way to do it, but the principles behind that were around transparency and agency and participation and fairness. So whatever kind of practice you want to try on, think about what you're designing for. That being said, the other thing I have to say about the way in which that's still dysfunctional, as is all of the incentive stuff, is through an equity lens. So Mm -hmm. you are just going to have people who, because of their lived experience or the color of their skin or the way that they were raised or whatever other privilege they've experienced, are very willing to advocate for themselves at the expense of others And that is largely how bonuses get paid in a lot of places is by who is the most comfortable fighting to prove that they are better than the people sitting next to them who make them successful. And as a person who has been great at that game in my career, it is not fair. It is not a fair way to pay people. Yeah. And, and what's worse when you have a team like the one you just described where one person is different than the other nine, Mm -hmm. the likelihood that they're going to do great in that whole, you know, even in that transparent scenario, it's not 100%. Like it is, you know, it might be okay if the team is especially self-aware and there is safety for those conversations to happen and advocacy. But like just as likely they get the short end of the stick in that scenario. So it is, I think it's the ultimate 
design constraint is is equity and bias and it, that's why it always drives me back to like can we agree on the method that that makes it formulaic in a way where it ignores those differences where it literally yeah. like you wouldn't need to know the color of someone's skin or their name or their identity in order to allocate what their fair share is and and that would be lovely and one of the reasons that i really like how nathan and convertkit approach it is because since they do formulaic approach to profit sharing, peanut butter, everybody gets the same. I think it's based on tenure, but otherwise it's the same. Yeah. What that also does is it puts pressure on the teams to actually do something about those who are underperforming. Right. So in systems where there's an additional ranking or sorting or whatever, and then we're rewarded accordingly, it's like, oh, well, Bob sucks and we all know he sucks, but he got the least amount of the money. When mm. Bob makes the same amount of money that I do, now all of a sudden I'm motivated to do something about <laughs> Bob, who I've just been ignoring and being like, well, he'll get his at the end of the year. Interesting. Yeah, that is a, a fun design outcome. I mean, that's that's the game, right? Well, the game we should be playing is seeing both sides of the coin of each of these models like that and exploring what might happen and then aligning to something that we think is worth trying and seeing if that's true, right? Did we go two years and nobody ever complains about anybody? And is that actually how we feel or is there something under the radar, right? I love that. As always, if you like what you're hearing, a review would mean a ton to us or share our show with someone who needs it or just subscribe. Any of those things will help more people find us more easily. So we've talked a lot about what's wrong with the current system of performance management and end of year reviews and all the related shenanigans, but we haven't talked a lot about what to do if you're just stuck in a system like that, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're not the CEO, if you're not the founder, if you're not the boss, and you're in a system and you know that there's a possibility to do better or to hack it or to subvert it, you know, what do you do then? So I'd be curious to just hear you kind of, yeah, weave a yarn on what are some ways to kind of work within Yeah, because we know a lot of folks out there are stuck in in and with what they've got, don't have a lot of ability to make changes. Even really senior leaders that we talk to are kind of like, yeah, this is 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 the the reality. (laughs) This is the water. So if you're you're a person who has management, quote unquote, responsibility for other people, you have some ability to make this a better experience. At the very least, I would be having very transparent conversations with people about what you're going to put in their review so that they don't have to have that like roller coaster feeling when they just open it on a Monday <laughs> morning to see, you know, what their fate is. Drum roll, please. Yeah, right. I've had that. It's so unpleasant. Be having really transparent conversations and use the time to make it be not just developmental from your perspective as a manager to be like, here are the ways you suck, go get better, but instead to really ask and listen carefully to what the people who report to you are saying about their self-identified gaps and to like not be linear about that. So if what someone says is, I'm really struggling with overwork or burnout or anxiety, don't send them to like an Excel class, you know, Mm -hmm. ask them what they feel like they would need. We use this question a lot to do the best work that they can be doing or to do the best work of their life. You can use even the shittiest performance management process as just a reminder to have a conversation that is decidedly not shitty. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think one small twist that I'm a fan of that still sort of plays within the bounds of the current system is to shift from do your job to what are you trying to do? Where are you Mm. trying to go? So Mm -hmm. for someone that is just getting feedback where it's like, here's why you suck. Here's how to do your job better. That feels very static and very fixed to me and probably to them too. But I really love one of my favorite coaching questions is just like, tell me what you're trying to do. Like, are you trying to end up with a book deal? Are you trying to end up with a really relaxed 30 hour work week? Are you trying to be the CEO? Like, tell me what you're trying to do, because then the feedback I give you is not critical. It's not negative. It's actually dimensional to like, where are you going and what's your vector? And then it just feels great to talk about like, oh, well, I, you know, one of the things you could do that would really help you get into that corner office is blank. And so it feels more motivational to me. So I like that just like slight recalibration. I think that's really smart. And I also think if you're going to ask questions like that and you're a manager or you have leadership responsibility, you have a duty 
in that conversation to help people see beyond a ladder that they're trying to climb. Mm -hmm. Like listen to what people actually want and what they're amazingly and uniquely brilliant at and help them see other possibilities that aren't just like, can I get one step higher on this terrible, horrific climb to the top? And instead like (laughs) what, what other roles, what other responsibilities, what other experiences, what other teams could they go work on? Like be the kind of leader that is scanning the horizon for opportunities that would actually help your people enjoy their work and find meaning and purpose. And don't devolve into the conversation that is just about promotion and compensation. And know that even if that's what your employee is bringing to the conversation, it's because that's the, that's what the system is designed to highlight. So like, it's not their fault and it doesn't mean they can't have a more nuanced and more interesting and more lateral conversation it's the default position because it's what the system signals to us yes and as we spoke about before i really am a big fan of visualization and of Mm. of personalization in those conversations where yeah like climbing the ladder is fine and the hill and making more money and all those things that we're sort of like right at the surface of a review conversation yeah but to your point dig one layer deeper and just be like hey as part of this conversation, let's just both sit for a minute and imagine you in 10 years. Yeah. What are you doing? Who right. are you? What is what is amazingly actualized you look like? Mm-hmm. And if we can both sit with that for a second, maybe we'll have a more interesting 2021. Mm-hmm. Yes. I love that. And what about if you are someone this is being done to? <laughs> <laughs> What if you're just the the person who is the individual contributor and who just has to write their self-review and rate themselves and then justify their existence and go to the office review in hand to defend their year? What what then? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, number one, it's a fine time to look for another job. <laughs> but But number two, the best advice I've gotten in the last two years that has changed the way I deal with feedback systems that maybe aren't invited or aren't welcome is when you hear a piece of feedback, instead of figuring out how to defend against it at an ego level, just ask yourself the question, in what way might this be true? Mm -hmm. Find the nugget, use it, and discard the rest. And don't let it become an emotional roller coaster if you can avoid it by just saying like, uh, th- I'm, rather than trying to have this bounce off me or rather than trying to fight it or wrestle with it, I'm going to Aikido it by just saying like, there's some little grain of truth in what I'm hearing. I'm going to find that grain. I'm going to turn that into something that's developmental for me and fuck everybody else. Yeah. Like I just, that's that's a way to kind of keep your head in the midst of of what can be some dysfunction or toxic feedback cultures. The other thing too is actually try to be more authentic and more vulnerable and more connected and ask better questions. So Mm -hmm. you can disarm, not everybody. There are some people that are so far gone with their professional mask that it's like a waste of time to, to wrestle with that luchador. But there are people that like, if you just come with the right question or the right vulnerability or the right authenticity, you can get through and have a real conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it might be fun to play the game of like, if you're in a position where you have enough safety nudge a little bit see if you can see if you can create the kind of conversation we just mentioned the manager creating and if there's no there there then you know you got to play the game and you know start looking i love that i feel like you can even as you nudge that way I used to do this with my managers when I worked at a bank. I would be like, okay. Because I actually really liked the review conversation because I didn't get a lot of attention otherwise in terms of things like <laughs> right, right, uh, right. development. Yeah. It was like, well, it was just a time that was about me, which was you right. know one hour out of the year. So I really right. took advantage of that. And and what I would often say to one boss in particular who I worked for for a long time was like, okay, can we just take the first five minutes to check whatever box you need to check with HR? Like, what do you need mm-hmm. me to say or sign or acknowledge so that we can have a real conversation. Cause like, I'm not right. here to change your mind. You're not going to change my mind. So what do we need to do so that when we, then we can talk about me, which is why I'm here. <laughs> and it's like, you know, to the point of being disarming, I feel yeah. like just acknowledging the fact that we're all putting on this performance that we know is dysfunctional. Let's get over it. Let's, let's jump through the hoop that we must. And then let's try to make something of this that's actually useful and better. Mm. And to your other point about feedback, 
and looking for the nug in there. One trick I think for doing that well is to look at feedback as information, not identity. And it's much easier to find something that is true and operable if it, if you are not so enmeshed that Aaron right, said this right. thing to me and now I'm worried that I'm <laughs> a bad person or I'm stupid or I don't know how to do my job or I'm never going to amount to anything in this life. It's like try even before you go into the conversation to center yourself in like I am a whole person mm-hmm. with a whole life and people who love me. This is one person's opinion and they are about to give me information and I can hear whatever that is without it changing anything about who I am. And I will do something with it or I won't, but those two things should not be mistaken as being one. I love that message. And it's so easy to forget the subjectivity of everything when we're dealing with power. I mean, I've been working on a new project where there's a color that some of us think is purple. And some of us think is blue. Uh huh. And I'm just like, that's weird, right? We all go through life where we just have different rods and cones in our eyes and see different colors. Yeah. And once you accept that, you start to realize like that goes all the way to the macro, you know, and one person's opinion, one manager's opinion about what matters for you now and why might be right, might be wrong. It's really, yeah, it's eye of the beholder and it's up to you to interpret and to find and make meaning. And to your point, which is just really nice and I think really gentle to ourselves at the end of this really long, hard year. Don't let it become like a total identity disruption. Right. Just don't do it. Don't do not do it. <laughs> and, you know, when we think about the fact that we do all see color differently and certainly there's no such thing as objectivity around someone else's performance or behavior, take the information that you get and whether you're happy about it or not, Figure out what you want to do with it and see what support or broader perspective you might include. Like a lot of the best and most developmental moments in my career have been when I got information that I wasn't super happy about and felt like (laughs) a failure or felt like a challenge to my ego. But what I did with it was talk to people whose opinions I trusted to say, can you help me understand this better? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or like, if you were me, what would you do with this? Or is this something that you see in me? So, you know, to the point, it's one person's opinion. Maybe they see blue and you see purple. Take it as information. But then like, take back the agency to figure out what you're going to do with it. And maybe what you're going to do with it is like, put it in a drawer and never think about it again and like just burn it in effigy or maybe what you're <laughs> going to do about it is crowdsource some other ideas to see if there's something there that could be really beneficial. I mean, make it a team sport, right? Yeah, exactly. I'll wrap things up with a quick tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good all throughout the year. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work and eliminate or at least very much modify their end of year review process. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at theready.com. And as for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something.